All right, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, it's afternoon here in Portland time, Matt. We had a, a lot of confusion about PDS or PDT or PST on times. I thought it was also PPSTD or PTSD oh, or something. Oh, my goodness. This Ed DeRosa is bananas. Actually, Anyways, I, think, I think this whole thing might have left you with some PTSD. Oh, forget about it. Well, Matty, we haven't done a hangout for a live racing in Portland Meadows in an, about six or seven months, but... Uh, and we hadn't planned on doing one till October because the season doesn't start till October 12th. And now magically, a day showed up. We have, we have a, a racing day on Sunday. Now I want to explain some things for folks watching. There's no simulcasting of the races on Sunday, so it's it's a Portland only event. Uh, it will be broadcast. There will be videotape, obviously, because the stewards need video, and uh, it'll kind of be run like a regular day of racing, just. Only locally. We got a big barbecue starting tomorrow at five. They're going to be screening the movie Sea Biscuit at eight o'clock on a big twenty-foot screen. I'm, I've already got two separate dates for that event, and uh, then we'll be uh, doing the racing uh, Sunday. First post at twelve twenty. Eight races, two quarter horse, and a six thoroughbred. So uh, I, I know Matt, you you got a big day yourself tomorrow. Oh, it's only a two hundred thousand dollar race. It's 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 okay. <laughs> no, we've we, we got a monster card up here at Northlands, uh, 13 races, 12 thoroughbreds. We have the one-quarter horse uh, to, to kick things off, but it's it, it's probably one of the most wide-open derbies we've had in, in quite some time up here. 11 entered, and, and probably all 11 have a shot to win it. Is Glenn Todd represented at all? There will be uh, only on the card by Commander. We get to see the big horse, oh. nine-time stake winner here, but uh, that's all. Commander is money. Well, we got a few uh, extra guests joining us today. I'll just go uh, my... Right to left, uh, joining us from uh, are you Michael Dammer? Are you in the Bay Area or Northern Cal? I always forget. No, I'm in Los Angeles. Well, that's okay, Los Angeles. So uh, you can find Mike at the Raider fan. Never short on opinions uh, for horses or life, right? Nope, never. Huge, huge uh, game on dude fan. Uh, loves Baffert. So if you don't like Baffert, you go pick on Mike. That's how I met him. Yep, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you got to give him the guy he dresses well. Oh, man, forget about it. And then on the far left there with the uh, headphones on is uh, Handicapper Josh. Josh, you're in Vancouver, B.C., is that right? Yeah, that's correct. The uh, home of uh, beautiful Hastings Park. So, so you probably know of Matt. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah, Yeah, Matt's very famous in the B.C. There, there you go. <laughs> Broke a lot of hearts out in Burnaby. For all the wrong reasons. Oh, yeah. Oh, forget about it. Well, guys, let's uh, let's get into this card. I want to ask the two new guys that are joining us here. Uh, I don't know how often you guys looked at Portland Meadows races, but this is kind of a unique one because none of the horses have been running here because we haven't been running. Most of them are coming from the fair circuits. Did you guys, we'll start with Mike, had you heard of Tillamook Union, any of that kind of stuff? Only by name, uh, no reputation or anything, but uh, I did my best to do a little research last night, but I will admit I've never played any of those fair circuits or handicapped them before. So, Because you can't. They're not simulcast. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I don't know first thing about them. Josh, what about you? Now, you're a Northwest guy. Have you heard of some of these smaller tracks, or uh, are you are you kind of handicapping just off the paper? Uh, me and my dad have been to Prineville and Grants Pass in the past couple of years, so, yeah, I've got oh, a nice. taste of those. Hey, yeah, hey, I, uh, Matt, I've got so. I've got a guest announced at Tillamook and Grants Pass. Did you get some cheese? Yeah, yeah. And so, guys, in Tillamook, the famous cheese factory is there. If you enter, you get a block of cheese, and if you win, you get a full wheel of cheese, and it's presented by Miss Tillamook. Oh, this it's, is the first class all the way. It's honestly one of the most fun times you'll ever have at the races. Last, I went last year, and within two seconds, I had a, I had a big foot long corn dog. <laughs> and I spilled mustard all over my shirt. That doesn't surprise me. I've seen you have breakfast. Well, let's uh, let's dive into this little eight race extravaganza. We got first race, uh, quarter horse maidens going 300 yards. And you know, Maddie, we've talked over the years that the jump from the fair to Portland Meadows with the thoroughbreds is a pretty steep climb. But for the quarter horses, that's that's where the good quarter horses run in the winters on the fairs because they got some big purses. Yeah, they, they just don't have many options uh, at Portland for those quarter horse races. You guys offer what? Is it two a week? Uh, so a, a four, it'll be four a week. Four a week now, yeah. So th there's still not many options. So when they come, it's pretty much the same horses that are competing against each other. Uh, when you look at the actual Portland form, you're looking at shippers from Golden Gate, from Emerald Downs, kind of those higher-end thoroughbred meets, and they tend to have the edge. But, no, you're bang on. The, the, the quarter horse is a bit of a sideways move. That being said, uh, the horse I went with on top, number six, B.A. Snow and Oakies.
coming off a uh, very close uh, effort at uh, Emerald Downs, which, you know, obviously a much bigger circuit, but for quarter horses, it's not an extremely, I just thought his speed numbers and everything else pointed to this being the time for him to break through. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I was really between the two. Uh, I, I did not go with B.A. Snow and Okies. Um, I didn't care. The only thing care for the, the cutback in ground. I know it's not a, a much, but in, in, in quarter horses, of course, it is uh, quite a bit. I went to the two cashing in the bucks. Now, uh, Mike, you, you're you down in Southern California. Do you get out to Low Sal at all? Uh, yeah, occasionally. I go out there a few nights uh, every so often. Um, I went down there for the thoroughbred meet a few times, but uh, more Santa Anita than Low Sal. So what do you when you're handicapping a quarter horse race like this race? What were what were you looking for uh, to lead you to to your picks? I actually agree with you on B. A. Snow and Okies. I think his first race off the seven month layoff wasn't too bad, and I think he'll be uh, much better suited in this one. Um, I mainly look at a uh, I like an outside draw. Um, I like to see a horse that can break well. Um, raw times are are helpful, but not necessarily everything. But uh, I'll admit the quarter horses aren't my first thing, but uh, you know I enjoy watching them. Josh, what about you? Quarter horse guy at all? No, not really at all. <laughs> Where did you land in this first race? Uh, I went with the two. Uh, it's a bit of room to improve. Second race off the layoff, I thought could take a step forward there, and I think he has a good chance at finishing off today. Well, one thing, you know, jo uh, Josh, you mentioned you'd been to Prineville. Prineville's up at 3,000 feet. And so yeah. maybe the elevation change, Maddie, can uh, mean some more in the lungs. And he, I mean, it's also I think I think Josh is bang on when you talk about a horse who can improve second time off the layoff, especially making that transition from a two and now now a three year old. Uh, the horse ran a couple credible races last year. Uh, top of my head, the the, uh, the winner of that last race, uh, La, La Jackie, stands out. Yeah. She ran very well at Portland, didn't she? Yeah, La Jackie was a pretty good horse. That was a final uh, that 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 cashed in the Bucks ran second in. So uh, yeah. you know that's obviously a race that they had a trial for and uh, and had to get to. So uh, I think that race did stick out the most to me uh, for that one. I actually had that horse third. I went six three two in the first race. Yeah, it's two six three for me. I went uh, J S Mr Jazz. Just a horse who's always around it. I know I've been a little wind shy here, but uh, rarely worse than fourth. And I, I think I don't. I don't think thirds out of the question. I just really couldn't fall in love with anybody else. I don't really care for Cool Shavato. Uh, Chick Meter will have to be faster. Um, and losing ground going two fifty, hard to like. Hard to like a little more uh, fifty yards behind that one. And, and you know how much I love the ones on the outside, but couldn't make a case for Fly Reba Fly either. Mike, what about you? Uh, you got top three for this race? Yeah, I went 6-2 uh, with the uh, three. All right, it's so close to mine. I was 6-3-2. Josh, what about you? Yeah, I went 2-6-3 in this one. All right, well, so we'll see. We all you, you know what's going to happen here, Jay. I think the thing is we've seen this before. It's going to come 1-4-5. 1-4-7 or 1-4-5, yeah. I know how it works. All right, second race on the card, guys. Quarter horses again. Uh, once again, going 350 yards in this race. And uh, a few old veterans in here, and you got uh, down on the rail easily a smash hit coming off a few victories, but two for 24 at Portland Meadows. And uh, the angle I was going with in this race was not only do I like an outside draw, but number seven, Elbar D. Mighty Fine, coming out of a final for 7,300 against some really good horses, uh, two of which came back to win already. And this horse is three for seven. All three career wins for this horse have been right here at Portland Meadows. Yeah, but when you look at what the horse was beating to get those three wins, I think you have to look at easily a smash hit a little more credibly. Uh, LD Bard, uh, L. Bardi, mighty fine, just ran through the conditions here. And we've talked about these open claimers in, in quarter horse races. They're just so, so tough. Um, where I, Yeah, this horse won for 4,000, but I, I think is probably the, the one to beat here in easily a smash hit going for 7,500. Does the rail concern you guys at all? I went to the outside to uh, El Bar D. Marty Fine. Um, that was the uh, the deciding factor that I wasn't really fond of the rail draw. But, hey, you, uh, you won from the rail last time. No problem. He, he, he breaks. He breaks on top. That's Prineville, though, Matt. It's a way different rail. What about what about the what about the rail at UN then? I, Matt, nobody even knows where Union is. <laughs> well, he knew where the rail was. So there you go. It's somewhere out in the middle. That's all I know. But uh, no, and you know, and that horse beat El Bardi Snow Princesses uh, that day. Who, of course, uh, a sibling, I believe, of El Bardi Mighty Fine. You guys try announcing these things, saying them fast. Uh, yeah, and you'll have a little more appreciation for old Jace's job. Hey, yeah, how, how about my first race tomorrow? I got uh, FDD Trixie and FDD Queen's Dynasty. 
my uh, my friend Travis Stone that uh, announces at Monmouth Park now. He told me with quarter horses, he just throws out the initials, doesn't say them at all. No. Nope. <laughs> yeah, I think that's interesting. You know, one thing, uh, and I would pose this to uh, to Mike and Josh. We're seeing a lot of riders uh, for this little uh, one-day meet because obviously a lot of our regular riders up at Emerald, uh, you know, guys that we haven't seen before or, or you know, seen sparingly. Uh, do, do you guys know any of the names that we're seeing in some of these races, like Jesus Afanador or uh, Andrea Crookshank? Not even a little bit. <laughs> I mean, we've seen guys, Matt, like Luis Flores, Jose Guerrero. We see these guys pretty regularly. I think it's the same Lorenzo Lopez who was here early in the meet last year uh, and got off to a real flying start. But, you know, when it comes to the connections on a day like today, uh, you know, there's a lot of untold. You know, I've never heard of Marcelo Cardoso. Uh, you know, Jose Madrigal I've heard before, and Afanador wrote here uh, last year. But uh, definitely going to require, uh, you know, I mean, and, and you don't have days to watch. You only got, uh, you know a couple of races to get well, a feel for how, how some of the new folks ride. From from when you guys had quarter horses before, I mean, Gonzalez generally rides one of the better uh, quarter yeah. horses in every race. The same with uh, Guerrero. So I think you can kind of single in on those two. Uh, if, I, if I'm right about that, doesn't Cardoso ride for uh, Jonathan Nance later on the card? Well, that, and see, Maddie, that's why we pay you the big bucks. I'm just going to check this. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I was certainly looking at which trainers went with who. And, uh, you know, I mean, Don Young's a quarter horse trainer that's been around here for 100 years. And, you know, for him to, you know, maybe point to Lopez, maybe he knows this one. Afanador had ridden that horse before, the number four awesome Corona. But, I don't know, I, I, I ended up going uh, 7 one, 6 in this spot. If Cardoso's good enough to ride for a Jim Ferguson, he's good enough for me. <laughs> what about you guys? I went with the uh, seven one five here. Um, I think the five might be able to pick up the pieces in third and maybe sweeten it up. But uh, yeah, I thought seven one with the two clear horses to beat here. What about you, Josh? I went one seven two. I like the one. How both races this year are winning ones, and I think you'll get another win here today. Perfect. All right, guys, we're going to move on to Thoroughbred, which I think we agree is uh, all more in our wheelhouse. Uh, I, it's funny, though, Matt, last year, I don't know, I, you know, I was nailing the quarter horse races. You know what? The, the funny thing is I know everybody has different preferences, whether it's buyer numbers or prime power or the rag yeah. sheets or whatever people prefer. The numbers you get in the DRF, and uh, I believe you get the same ones in, in, in the Brisnet for the quarter horse races, yeah. they're very, very good. Yeah. So uh, race three now. No, uh, Mike, you asked me last night how come no routes, and uh, I think a big reason of that is because when they wrote the condition book, they were playing on a lot of horses who were Oregon breds who'd just been waiting around uh, for the fall meet, as well as a lot of horses coming off the fairs. They don't run a ton of routes at the fairs because they're bull ring tracks. Then you end up running two and three laps, and you know counting past three is difficult when you're on a horse, uh, and you don't want to. <laughs> oh, I'm probably gonna get fired for saying that, aren't I, Matt? <laughs> But uh, anyways, race number three, three-year-olds and up, non-winners since February 1st, which is essentially non-winners since Portland Meadows' last meet ended. We ended right the last week of January. Uh, and so, you know, you're getting horses, a number of them. In fact, the inside four, I think, all beaten double digits or really close to that uh, in their last few starts. Uh, I ended up going to J.J.'s Gypsy, who's just been in pretty honest form. And the other thing, he's he's got some speed. Other than uh, Call for the Wild, there's not a lot of early gas. The inside three all seem to be horses that come from pretty far off. And, you know, going only five and a half furlongs. One thing about Portland's track is it's that deep, sandy track. But, you know, I just I just give so much favor in a race like this to horses who are going to be out front because you just don't see a lot of these horses with the will to pass. I, went this, I thought the same thing you did. And I probably I ended up on the actually one just inside of yours and call for the wild who has yeah. been stopping but I think that race from two back at Boise would put him in the hunt anyways here uh, did press the pace three wide at Emerald obviously was facing probably a, a tougher competition there uh, I think I, I was between JJ's Gypsy and Call of the Wild I wouldn't be surprised to see either of them win but I did I did give the edge to the four. Yeah, I, I certainly think a, a 25 now winners in six months at Emerald, uh, I, I give a lot more credence to than a 2,500 at Tillamook uh, for the same conditions. But because you're just, you know, I mean, you, you see the horses in the in immigration, uh, you know, that horse I think he's probably made over $100,000, where a lot of these ones haven't even got close to that. But uh, I thought there was a few different ways to go and a few different horses to like. Uh, Mike, who did you end up with in top here? 
I'm taking a little shot with Kirk Aroth, the six. Um, I thought his last race up at Portland, I mean, he was a nice winning race uh, behind a next out winner in second. Um, he's been messing around with the fares, but I think uh, if he can find that last race at Portland, I think he'll be uh, heard from late. Um, I did think JJ's Gypsy made a lot of sense, and as well as Call for the Wild underneath. Josh, what about you? What did you see on this race? Yeah, I went with the five in this race. He's, I think he'll get to the lead. He's got the speed, and I think he'll finally hold on today. I don't see anyone coming from off the pace to eat him up today. You know, one of the reasons I like the five too, Maddie, is is Jorge Rosales, uh, who we've seen be a you know a good rider here over the last few years. Just kind of looking through the the card, it seems like him and Luis Gonzalez probably, uh, in terms of Portland Meadows, the two most accomplished uh, of the riders that'll be here on Sunday. Probably had some some of their their pick of the horses too. You would think. Uh, as well, so I think it, it does make a lot of sense to see where they end up. Uh, looking at the morning line, Southern Influence, uh, three to one. I couldn't see that, especially with the horse who wants to run on in a field that really doesn't have much speed at all. Yeah, it's it'll be real interesting to see these first couple of races, uh, how how the track plays. I mean, I'm sure it's supposed to be a real hot day. It's supposed to be about 88 degrees. Uh, I know they'll be watering the track a lot to try to keep the sand packed. But uh, I'll be real curious to see uh, how it plays for these first couple races, and with the you know with the late pick four on track and, and the pick five, Matty, uh, I th I don't think you're gonna have to get a lot of separation considering it's just gonna be the on track crowd betting, and with the barbecue contest and all the beer garden in the field, you might be having you know a more casual crowd as opposed to a uh, uh, you know a real sharp betting crowd. If, if they're going to be watering the track, I've seen you uh, in the booth on hot days. Are they going to water the announcer as well? Oh, forget about it, man. I, I, I told I told the general, uh, the general by the way on vacation this week. <laughs> I, I know I talked to him earlier in the week. Oh, he yeah he books his camping trip real good. Fourth race on the card, five furlongs, and now I thought this race, uh, contrary to the last one, this one had a ton of gas, and uh, you know for me I was trying to figure out who gets the lead in this spot. You know, impulsive Kate, I think her record here locally and her record her last three. Uh, she's certainly a, a big player in this race. I think she's just faster than everybody else. She loves Portland. She loves the distance. She's a 10-time winner in her five furlong races. She's uh, batting almost 50% in the winner's enclosure at Portland as well. Uh, trainer's having a great year, hitting at 34%. I think it's out of the gate and gone for Impulsive Kate. Mike, what about you? Did, did, was it Impulsive Kate for you and nobody else? or Because I didn't put her on top. Oh, uh, yeah, if I put her on top. I thought she was clear uh, clear the one to beat here. Um, the only other one I gave the look at was the five, my secret weapon. Well, and that's who I went with on top. And my reason being is Impulsive Kate, she's, she, you know, it, if you look at her wins, for the most part, she's in front. The one, two back at Prineville, uh, she did blow by somebody uh, at the eighth pole and drew off. But for the most part, she's kind of had it her own way. But there's a lot of early speed here. Early Habit was opened up four in a five furlong race last time. Uh, can go pretty fair opening quarter mile. Uh, it doesn't does make it tough when, when you can't see the, the splits. Yes. Well, yeah, God bless fair racing, man. Well, I mean, Early Habit couldn't make the lead at Portland uh, when she was facing better company. So I don't know if she went, is, is as fast as Impulsive Kate. We know how good those uh, City of Roses Philly Mare Sprint came up, and Impulsive Kate was yeah. able to win those. So I think if she runs back in anything like those, it's it's all over um, for everybody else in here. I don't mind the one my Maggie May, but it's Impulsive Kate and everybody else. My uh, yeah, I, w I went with five and the uh, two, but I also threw the seven Shane and Melena in for a bit of a price, coming off a, a pretty decent win last time. I was favored that day. Prior to that, had been running at Boise and Portland Meadows as a big price, but had a couple of uh, decent efforts and thought she could might or might be able to run in. Josh, did you have any price plays you liked in here outside of maybe the two or the five? Uh, the one I kind of looked at a bit. I don't know if he's a great price. It's a six. Close uh -huh. call. Well, with Jonathan Nance, you got to think Matt that horse will get some betting. Uh, coming in from Colorado. Yeah, I thought it was like three to one or something yeah, like that. I, but I, but I just pulled off the DRF and it's, it's up at five to two. So yeah, I wouldn't well, touch yeah. that. Yeah, but I mean, you do got to say the Rapaho is, is certainly a, a a class advantage compared to the fairs. Yeah, but but uh, he's also he was in non two land there. I mean, she's a five year old yeah. maiden breaker who just loves to run third. She's got ten thirds on her thing. Uh, I, I'm with Josh on this one. I wouldn't touch this horse anywhere near five to two. If you can get maybe nine to two on it, something a little better better than 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 a horse who just doesn't doesn't want to win. I mean, four straight third place finishes, just a pack animal. Man, yeah, I spent my life. 
I spent my life in non two land. <laughs> I thought you were, I thought you were still a maiden. No, oh, you ain't a kid. <laughs> Josh, you were gonna say something before we rudely interrupted. You know, yes, I think the two will go down from the morning line and six will go up. I find it hard to believe the two will go off at seven to two or four to one or whatever it is at. One yeah, one thing that's gonna be real interesting with the betting is because it's not simulcast. Matt, it ain't going to take more than a couple hundred bucks to, to really sway the odds one way or another. And, and if Ron Sutton is on track and betting, forget about it. <laughs> is that enough right there to kill the odds? Oh, Ronnie can hammer him. Uh, it's our one of our HPPA guys. <laughs> Anyways, race number five, it starts the, uh, the late pick four. Now, Portland Meadows, your pick four is always 14% takeout rate. New this year, Matt, the pick five, it's all, last year it was a 25-cent wager. Because of our friends in Canada, we won not we knocked it down to twenty cents. You can't leave out the Canadians. No, we love our Canadian betters <laughs> at Portland Meadows. But uh, race number five, three year olds and up, non winners of three lifetime, five and a half furlongs, and uh, I ended up going out to the number six bold plan. Bob Lawrence is a pretty solid trainer, and this is a horse who last time he was here at Portland Meadows was scoring a nice upset win over a horse who came back to win, and then. Uh, you know, went over to Boise, ran a couple of decent races. I mean, they weren't bad. He, they were kind of just even tries. And, uh, you know, my hope is maybe that now he'll come back here and, uh, you know, maybe get a little bit more pace to run at. Yeah, I, I really didn't get a, a great feel for this race. Yeah. I think it kind of took the this easy This is a good betting race, I think. Yeah, I, I know I just knocked a horse for not wanting to win and running third ten times. I've just, I put a horse on top who's run second eight or ten times in here in the three and all-star stand. I just, I just think that I like the last couple of races. Uh, the horses run well at Portland. Uh, but another one, just it's, it's a matter of what price you're willing to accept because he doesn't like to win either. If I remember correctly too, Matt, trainer Benny Webb had a couple pop early in the meet last year. Uh, I know he won with one on Emerald opening day last year, and so uh, he certainly can have one ready uh, coming into a track for the first time. And you know, and, and like like we talked about earlier, this horse does have speed, and there's not a ton of gas in here. I mean, the horse right to his outside, Victor's Legend, probably goes, uh, and maybe Big Bert. But other than that, there's not a ton of pace. Mr. Cougar Gold's a horse on the outside, guys. That's uh, that's coming off some wins. Either uh, Matt or uh, Josh, or I'm sorry, Mike or Josh. You guys give this guy a look on the far outside. Yeah, I had him on top actually. Oh, nice. What, what was it you liked about the horse? Oh uh, well, I like this year. He's hasn't missed the board two wins, his last two are wins, and I didn't really love this race and thought if he can improve a bit more, I don't think it should be too much to ask for him to get it done here. Yeah, Lorenzo Lopez was our, uh, our our top jock last year for the first few weeks of the meet. Uh, he got off to a red, I think he won four or something on opening day, and so uh, if he can come out firing. Mike, where did you go in this fifth race? Um, well, admittedly, I changed my mind about half a dozen times on this race. Um, I did end up going with the four. I think he'll be... Uh, He'll definitely be out near the lead, if not on it, and clear. Um, there's really not much in here for me to get excited about. I went with the four with over the uh, the eight and the seven. Yeah, I went to six, three, eight for me. Bold plan, all star stand, and then Mr. Cougar goal. Matty, what about your top three? I went three, seven, eight. So, it, like you mentioned off the top, it's a good betting race where if, if you can find an opinion, uh, feel free to, to whack away because I don't think there's going to be a strong, strong favorite in here. Race uh, six starts the uh, final pick three on the card. Just five furlongs, so they'll be uh, out there gunning a field of eight. And, uh, you know, Matt, last time we saw Hawk here at Portland Meadows, he put in one of the biggest performances of the year we saw last year. Uh, came back with a win on the fair circuit and then got beat a couple times at Grants Pass. Uh, he showed, I mean, the start before that big win, he came from dead last, or, yeah, he was dead last early on to get the win. So he's. Seems somewhat versatile, and uh, you know he might be one that just likes Portland Meadows, and I think maybe Jim Ferguson has him ready to go here. I wouldn't be shocked uh, to see Hawk run run a good race. Uh, horse looks like he just kind of figured it out with that big second place effort. Then he came back with that win, and then won by what it was the 16 lengths in the end there, crushing a field. And yeah, he was in allowance races in his last two at, at uh, Grants Pass, but those were actually legitimate horses that beat him in Seattle Diner and Captain Gavel. Those are open claimers for about the same price tag. That uh, that 16-length win was the last race of the season last year, Matty. He, he had a fast racing strip for you. He, he put an exclamation point <laughs> on, on the, year? the uh, 
on the season. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just I'm a big Ferguson fan, and I, I think the horse when he's when he's right, man, he can pop with a with a really nice win. And so uh, I went with him on top. I actually went Ferguson for the exacta. Uh, I put Susami in here. I know. Uh, I remember my buddy Mark Anderson wasn't a big fan of this horse, uh, and he, he said she just kind of doesn't uh, finish the job, and he was worried about that. Well, but, uh, I, I went to the other Ferguson horse that I went to, went to in here is the eight and Sue Somni. What was that? I actually went to the other Ferguson horse, and I went to the eight and Sue Somni. Um, we talked about it off the top uh, with with Ferguson, and you, you really got to pay attention to who rides for him as, as they will ride for him, and if you ride well, you're going to ride the barn. Uh, Rosales and, and him got along very well last year. They hit it 30% at the meet. Uh, I think this is Sue Somni. Sue Somni's distance hitting the board in 10 over 11 tries with three wins to, her, to his credit. I think it does say something that Rosales goes with uh, with Susami in this spot over Hawk because he was on board for those two big wins uh, with Hawk last year. And, uh, you know, he's certainly been first call for the Fergie Bar in the last year and a half or so. And that was enough that really tipped, tipped the hand, I thought, uh, to go that way for me. What about you, Raider fan? <laughs> um. I actually went uh, towards the inside of the number two, uh, Twist My Kazoo. Um, you I, like that, wouldn't you? <laughs> it looked like there was a lot of pace in this race, and he looks to be the only one that can actually sit off us and run late. Um, I know five furlongs isn't the best distance for a closer, but kind of, I just felt like the race would set up for him. At least you'd get a good shot at it. Um, and underneath, I like the eight, Susami. I tell you, Matt, what do you think about closers in five eighth races? Because I tend to think sometimes five, five and a half, the riders think it's so much about getting out in front, and then all of a sudden it ends up not being as much about that. And then I've, got, I've got no problem playing late running sprinters um, when they're sprinting. It's funny that people think that oh, well, the horse wants to run longer, so they should be able to, to tackle a route, yeah. and they don't. Some just have no speed for the first two furlongs and have a, a short little three furlong burst, and I wouldn't be scared at all. I mean, look at uh, who was that or the, the turf horse Chamberlain Bridge that would run on yeah. and probably was a 15-time winner going five furlongs in the grass. So uh, late runners, doesn't, doesn't concern me as long as you're not going to get loose. Chamberlain Bridge, BC uh, Turf Sprint, Matty. Old Jace got a fat wall at that day. <laughs> it, was, it was nice. Josh, how did you see this sixth race? Yeah, I agreed with the closing on the two. I thought there's a lot of pace on there. And I don't know if he's the best horse in the race, but I think if there's a speed duel up there, he's the only one who really wants to sit off and – if it collapses, I think he'll come late rolling in the stretch and pick him up. Yeah, look at that race two back for Twist Mike Kazoo, July 19th. Five furlong race comes from 14 lengths back to win. Well, finishing 50, 50, was it 58 and 2? That's a good time. 58 and 2, which is, you know, reasonable. I mean, and Boise's, I think, a 7 eighths track, so five furlongs is a, you know, it's a, it's a similar layout to what we would see here. Uh, so it's a one turn race. Boy, you don't see a, a, a t- <laughs> he made up uh, seven lengths between the quarter pole and the eighth pole. And it wasn't, they weren't going crazy up front. I mean, 22 and no. 145 is, is reasonable going that distance. So uh, yeah. if, if, I, I wouldn't blame, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to see the horse win. Uh, I did put them for second on my ticket. It was 827 for me. 482 for me in the sixth. All right, race number seven. It starts our late daily double. We get out daily double, uh, and uh, we got a couple bigger fields now, Manny. I was kind of surprised. I was honestly expecting a lot of five, sixes, and sevens, and uh, we got a. This is a nice little bit in daily double. Well, this is. I, I'm surprised at the price on the horse that we talked about uh, the other day. Who, who'd you make the morning line favorite? The eight horse in Bretta Clyde. Well, I didn't make the morning line, and I don't believe the general did either. I believe it was courtesy of uh, Nichelle Milner, who was filling in as racing secretary. Oh. Uh, but Bretta Clyde, you know, the the move down from Emerald is a, is it's a big move. Well, look uh, at who he was running with when he was at, at Portland Meadows last. He was in those allowance non thousand race or nine thousand. Oh, he was races. running really good and, races here. Yeah, it goes in for ten. I mean, I think if you're another late running sprinter, we talked about if he runs that race from two back, uh, I think he hammers his field. Yeah, I actually uh, I put him second. I went with uh, down on the uh, toward the inside number two, Free Return, who is a, a former Hollendorfer horse. Uh, I know uh, our friend Mike, a big Golden Gate Fields guy, and uh, this, this is one that came from the Hollendorfer barn, got claimed for twenty five hundred. Kind of went on tilt there, but after he was given a little bit of a break and he got over to Boise, it seems like the last couple races he maybe found a little bit of confidence. Uh, 
you know, he was running in, in a mile race last time, now gets to cut back uh, to some sprint. I mean, you see him going in an 870 race, three starts back, and then a mile. So uh, clearly he's versatile, but now he gets six furlongs, uh, and I just think he's going to be on or near the pace, and there, there is a fair amount of speed in this race. What do you do with a horse like the six, shake, ready, and roll? Uh, what did I do with the horse like? Well, I didn't put him in my top three. That's what I did with him. <laughs> no, I, I, he, I mean, he's got a great record here locally. He's been in the 15 to 26 in the money. Yeah, and I just think he's just a horse that they, they can do anything they want with him. You can see when he was here last time, he was in those route claiming series, uh, yeah. running from well back. He's got a little more tactical speed this year as a five-year-old. Um, I, I, whatever Fergie's done with him, they've uh, figured him out. And again, Rosalba shows up here, so I think that's also a good sign. Josh, this race is a little more to dig your te sink your teeth into from a handicapping perspective. How did you see this seventh race? Uh, I couldn't go anywhere but the eight. I just thought coming from Emerald and the fact that he could hold his own there for some races, I thought the class relief down here, I didn't think there's really any way he could lose this race. Yeah, I mean, he's... Uh, he that second two back behind Marvin's Magic, who then came back to win again. You know, I mentioned uh, immigration earlier. I mean, that's just he's just an an old war horse up there at Emerald Downs, and so uh, Brett Clyde never won here at Portland Meadows, Matt, but put in a couple of really good efforts. One of those second places, he was uh, left at the gate, came flying late, and almost won. And if I remember correctly, Gary Doherty, the Seattle Times handicapper, needed that for a pick five or pick four win. So, uh, so Gary probably holding a grudge on that one. Oh jeez! Oh, it's it's easy it's uh, easy to remember those ones, uh, especially if it is ugly. But Brother Clyde, I mean, he's obviously run incredible races here. It's not like that horse last year, uh, Olympic Lights. Was it Olympic Lights who hadn't hit the board at, at Portland and was in for? He'd never won. He'd never won at Portland. He'd won like 17 times at Emerald. Yeah, but and then he comes out of Portland and whatever it is, he just didn't like the surface and could never, ever, ever get his feet going. Uh, Brother Clyde's, I, I think, run incredible enough races where he's been second uh, that that he, he can beat this field. We run good races here at Portland Meadows. Mike, what about you, the seventh race? I went with free return on top over the uh, over the eight, Brett Clyde. Um, I just think free return is running against better and at Boise, and uh, uh, he's got two wins over the surface. And Yeah, I just think he'll get a good shot. Matt, one we didn't mention that I want to mention before we move on to the last race is uh, multiple Portland Meadows route claiming series champion, Swiss Exploit. Well, I don't know if six furlongs is his cup of tea. <laughs> that would be my concern. Yeah, no, I, I don't think it's his trip. But what we've seen with him is he likes to run really horribly for like five or six, seven starts in a row. And then he starts, and then he finds like a three or four race window where he starts crushing them. Well, he, he's got his five or six in a row now. So if, if he's going to turn it around, I guess now would be the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's my angle. I got, I got him. I got him third there, and I, you know, if I'm playing a pick four, I'm putting him in there. So, uh, if he's uh, race one, you, you, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't pay me enough money to bet on him that low. Uh, six furlongs. I mean, yeah, he's one for eighteen, so he's got one win at least to his credit. But uh, no thanks. He's one to five if that race is a mile and a quarter. Absolutely, he, I, I, I guarantee you he would be. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's uh, race what number I, eight. The uh, what finale happened. race. Race number eight goes a field of ten at uh, five and a half furlongs. I don't know why, but as an announcer, five and a half furlongs is my favorite distance. I feel that, especially with a big field, because you can get through the whole field right when they go into the turn, and that's kind of when the action starts, and you can start over. I love these kind of races. I think it's a wide open race. Yeah, who uh, do you like? What's that? Who do you like then? I went with the John Nance shipper from Arapahoe Park. Uh, I think it could be a good day for Natasha Coddington. Uh, and uh, this horse cutting back from a mile, you know, I'm just giving the credibility that the races at Arapahoe are, are, are decent, good races. And uh, we've seen horses ship in from there and fare pretty well. And uh, that was kind of my angle here. I was just concerned with the distance again. Same thing with Swiss Exploit. I'm not sure it's enough ground. I mean, two six furlong tries were kind of flat efforts and before then everything was a mile he had lots of turf through his running lines obviously kept some good company with open runners down there at um, uh, Turf Paradise Miscommunications a $25,000 horse at Hastings uh, Bill Bow was an allowance winner at Hastings so she kept some good company uh, but I uh, just don't, don't care for the distance well, the other thing that scares me is the whole three for fifty-seven thing. Well, and also the old for twenty-eight the last two years doesn't uh, bode well. 
it's one of those things where I don't think I would bet this horse to win, but I would put him in my exotics, and I picked him on top. But I guess I just couldn't find a whole lot, and I'm hoping the class drop wakes him up as well as the elevation change. I'm giving big, I'm big on elevation, Matt, because you know I, I've been hanging out here in Central Oregon, and I tell you, when I come back to Portland for the weekend, I'm way more spry. So you're saying this is like blood doping, then? No, 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 no. This is natural. <laughs> Shifting of ground, like well, you know, when Phil Mickelson goes to play in uh, in Colorado, he's hitting them four hundred yards. Well, there you go. I guess that guy, really that guy and that guy certainly isn't uh, blood doping. He's he's donut doping. <laughs> donut dunking. Come on, no, don't, bag love, on, don't bag I on. Don't bag on him. I love me some Phil. Mike, uh, ten horses in this spot. How'd you see the race? I uh, I went to the seven. Color me tough. Um, nine of his ten wins have been at Portland Meadows. He's got three wins at the distance. And uh, I don't know. Looking at the non-winners since February first, he's got a win on January twenty-sixth. So the race seems like it's right up his alley. Yeah, that was January twenty-sixth was closing day, and uh, that's that's a that's a good angle in that last race. Even though she got crunched pretty good in it, two of those horses came back to win. Uh, and it, to me, it looks like a race that's kind of a throwout. If this horse has always shown speed, and then magically is 15 lengths behind. Uh, I think you know, she after a up and didn't even try at that point. Yeah, I got to think she wasn't really persevered with, uh, you know, because, yeah, what, what is the point? But uh, any price plays in here uh, in addition to the seven for you, Mike? Um, not really. I kind of went with the five underneath, and then uh, that's about it. Um, maybe the eight as well, but uh, I was mainly seven, five here. What about you, Josh? I won with the eight on top. Uh, it's four of its six winter at Portland, and his last two races weren't that bad, and it's good at this distance. So with six of eight in the top two, I had this distance. I didn't really have a strong feel for this race, but I kind of leaned to this one. If I remember correctly, uh, Maddie, Midnight Maddie won the second leg. of the, It's not on my PP yeah, here, but won the leg. second leg. And I think it was the five-and-a-half furlong race, and it was a big price that day. 31 to 1. See, my memory's not too bad. Sharp. Old Jason, I, uh, a little sharper than Will gives him credit for. I went, uh, I was between the two horses, the 7 Color Me Tough and the 8 Midnight Maddie. I did, I did head to the 7 Color Me Tough uh, for something crazy, maybe the 10, the Doll Room, second time off the bench. My crazy pick in this one, I went 4 or 5, and then the 1. Uh, dwelt Lost Rider and then refused 2 and 3 starts back up at Emerald. And, you know, maybe he just, you know, maybe he's not a fan of Seattle. Maybe, maybe he doesn't uh, want to be a resource yeah. anymore. It would be my concern. <laughs> well, but then they go to Tillamook, and you get down here in the beautiful Oregon country and runs a pretty nice little third out of four. I was going to say, how many horses were in the field? <laughs> That was my crazy pick, though, because, you know, if you do go back a little ways, by a little ways, I mean, you know, just back to May, this horse had a nice second turf paradise, ran a couple competitive races at Emerald and was bet very hard, and then something, I think something mentally kind of went askew, and I think now the brain's coming back, you know? Well, I, I'm just a fan of, in these non-winners of the year, of horses who've shown they want to win and, and have more wins. I mean, this horse still has conditions to run through, uh, a non-three lifetime as well as a few others in here. So I'm going to go to the uh, the ten-time winner of the bunch, who the gal shown she wants to be there. Mike, what about you? On the, do we we already got your picks, didn't we? You're on the seven. Yeah, seven five eight. What about you, Josh? Uh, eight seven ten. All right. Well, guys, uh, eight races. We're getting underway at uh, twelve twenty. On, uh, on Sunday at uh, Portland Meadows. It's going to be a fantastic day. The festivities start tomorrow. The barbecue cook-off. We've got some of the top pit masters in the Northwest. Matt, I'm going to gain at least six and a half pounds this weekend. What's the first thing you're going for? Brisket? Ribs? Oh, baby back ribs, buddy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the greatest moment of my career at Portland Meadows was last year on Portland Mile Day. Will, our general manager, who I love more than anybody in this world, because uh, he pays me money, uh... I'm doing press releases for the Portland Mile. I'm tired. It's 6 o'clock. He comes in with a full tray of 10 different ribs. Oh, wow. Uh, from the contest. I, I tell you, man, I, I, I sat there and I said, you know what? Blood Horse can wait an extra 30 minutes. I, I, I mean, I, I, did, it even, did it even take you 30 minutes to hammer those down or no? 
No, no, but I had to bask in the fatness <laughs> afterwards. It was so great. But uh, 8 o'clock, Seabiscuit screening tomorrow night in the infield. No charge for parking, no charge for admission. Uh, the barbecue sampling is like 1 to 3 bucks for the barbecue samples. There will be a beer garden. It's uh, You know, Matt, you ought to just bypass the Canadian Derby and come down here. Uh, I'd probably be living with you then because I'm much of a job after that. Uh, just took off tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Mike, thank you so much for uh, joining us from uh, California. It's always fun chat with you on Twitter, at the Raider fan. Yeah, definitely. It was fun. And Josh, thank you. Uh, Josh, you just got back from Del Mar. Yeah, yeah. Last what a night. rough life you got. <laughs> I know. Oh, brutal. Well, guys, thank you so much. Rachel, thank you. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody at the track uh, on Sunday. If you can't make it out, we're not simulcasting the races, so uh, you're kind of out of luck for uh, for watching them if you're out of town. But uh, the regular season will start October 12th. Stay tuned to portlandmeadows.com for uh, more details. We'll catch up with you guys uh, in October.